All right. Okay, we are about ready to get started. This is IPPM, IP Performance Measurement at IETF 118. If you're not here for IPPM, if you are here for PPM, you're in the wrong room. If there are people in PPM who are here, who are there for IPPM, I hope they get, I hope they get here. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we start, we will need a note taker again. Um, can we please get a volunteer to help take notes? If um, also do remember to sign in to Meet Echo here so that we know how many people are in the room. And again, we are going to need a note taker to help out before we get started. Uh, Marcus has very kindly added all the agenda items into there. So you just need to fill out the discussion points and who says what. We're going to need to get a note taker before we get started. And the more time we spend here, the less time we'll have on content. All right, anybody, can we get a note taker? Ideal to get someone who's not otherwise presenting. It really makes me earn the cookies in the break. So. Exactly. Anybody? Frank, could we get you to help out? Could someone help patch the end of the meeting if Frank starts it out? Back there? What was your name? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, it's uh, if you go into Medico, there's a note taking tool. Um, it's also accessible off of the agenda. And I think we have a link later in the slides. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so thanks a lot for taking notes. Uh, so please, everyone, also take note of the note well. This is an IETF meeting, and we operate under the note well. It provides guidance on things like IPR and your code of conduct. So please familiarize yourself with this if you haven't. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, meeting management, we have a note taker, so that's great. Uh, <clears throat> I have a quick suggestion because often we have people in the meeting room for the first time who are not familiar with the tools. Um, are you able to bring up the web page? Just because the way I access the meeting notes is through the agenda, that's the way I find it easiest. So if you know how to access the agenda page and you see the little icons there next to each meeting, one click will take you into the meeting page uh, for notes and and it's a it's it's a really nice collaborative editing tool yeah so even though we have one volunteer if other people who haven't done it before want to follow along and learn how it works just click that link bring up the editor if you see somebody make spelling mistakes or misquote a question uh, you can help by fixing it uh, and it's a great way to get involved with the ITF process and make yep. a contribution and not just be in the room playing minesweeper that's an excellent suggestion. Thanks a lot for that. Right. Um, <clears throat> and please, everyone, uh, log in either using your, your mobile device using this QR code or log into the Meet Echo tool in, on your laptop. Uh, queuing management will be handled throughout this tool. So uh, if you want to make comments or questions, uh, please enter yourself to the queue in the system here before you uh, go up and talk at the mic. Um, all the slides for all the present presenters are loaded into the system here. So uh, they are preloaded and we can drive them or, or you can drive them with this thing, hopefully, uh, in any way. But uh, there's, there should be no need for, for sharing external screens or anything like that. Um, I'm not sure if we need a specific Jabber scribe or if we can just, we can just follow, follow along there. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, we have an agenda for today. Uh, as usual, we will be starting with adopted working group uh, documents. So we have a set of documents here. Uh, we have uh, the newly adopted hybrid two-step. Uh, we have some updates on encrypted PDM, data integrity, responsiveness, and stamp Yang. And then, as usual, we will also be uh, following up with uh, documents and items that have uh, been discussed uh, extensively in the group, but not yet adopted. So we have a set of interesting talks here, interesting documents to, to go through. Um, and these are usually given a little bit more time. And then we will round off with a set of lightning talks. So these are uh, working group. Uh, these, these are internet drafts that are uh, new to the working group uh, and have not yet had much discussion on the list. So it's a way for for, for the authors to, to quickly present their work and try to gain attention from people to, to, to uh, facilitate more discussion. And usually these lightning talks, we want to keep them very brief to one slide, just presenting on a high level overview of your work to basically gain the interest of the community. Um, do we have any comments or any bashing on the agenda? Great. You come up to present, Greg. Thank you, great. Um, one other just minor note I'll mention, um, the ISG has since the last time announced that they're gonna be restructuring some of the areas. And so the plan is for IPPM as a working group to be moving from transport over to ops um, starting in the next meeting cycle. That won't really change anything as far as how this, how this runs. Maybe it'll make the scheduling a bit better for people, but just letting people know about that um, and that uh, we'll likely have some shifts coming up in the responsible ABs um, after next meeting. Do you want to try with this or do you want me to um, okay. see if it works? Yeah. Let's try. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you for uh, your comments and support uh, during the working ad adoption poll. Uh, just because it was uh, so close to the meeting. Uh, so, still working on uh, addressing the comments, but uh, that will be coming shortly. Okay, just... Uh, no. Okay, yeah, I'll draw it. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know where to put it, where to point. <laughs> okay, um, Okay. so uh, the protocol, what's the purpose? It, it's a um, proposed uh, method for collecting uh, on-path telemetry uh, from the host traversing the following their uh, uh, packet that is equipped and uh, enhanced uh, with their information uh, that makes it a hybrid method. So uh, one of the advantages of that is that uh, the collection, even though their uh, information is uh, very useful, but it uh, cannot be collected out of band comparing to their uh, data flow that being monitored. So thus, uh, it follows the same physical path, but can use a different uh, class of service, so not to consume the same resources. And the uh, applicability of this method could be, for example, uh, the combination with the IAM direct expert or with the alternate marking method. So, and again, uh, that could be done either for uh, raw data or for aggregated statistically processed walk according to the local policy data, collecting them. So that um, simplifies the correlation of information that, uh, for example, uh, the same node participates in a, a number of uh, monitoring activities for different uh, data flows, as well as uh, downstream collection mode, uh, this protocol allows for the upstream collection mode. For example, if uh, it's beneficial to have this information being uh, delivered to the source. Although uh, one of the ideas is that um, following the LMAP uh, architecture, uh, their uh, processing of on-path telemetry information is done by the collector. So you have an agent and measurement agent, and then you have a collector. And then you have a controller that co coordinates and orchestrates all their activities. And LMAP is a working group that existed and uh, uh, produced their uh, measurement uh, in the large scale uh, access networks. Okay, so uh, 
because uh, the information is important. Uh, this protocol allows for uh, integrity uh, protection using HMAC, and each of the nodes participating signs it, but because it's a aggregated uh, collectively downstream or upstream, so there is no need that each node knows of their HMAC, of their any uh, other nodes, only their uh, uh, collector that processes the information. So the next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, this is um, part of their active uh, measurement protocol uh, in a hybrid. So in a hybrid, we know that it's a combination of passive measurement and active measurement. And uh, here, there, uh, there are packets being injected, although they are not phase sharing in terms of the class of service. So they, they follow the same path, but not the uh, class of service. So resources are uh, less uh, impact on the network. Uh, next slide. And uh, as mentioned, so it could be uh, used for a uh, direct export or alternate marking method. Next slide. So, and here's, here is an example of one of their uh, uses of uh, hybrid uh, two-step is that uh, we have a, a trigger packet that uh, triggers uh, their creation of injection of the HTS uh, packet. And it uses the same, uh, data plane encapsulation, although uh, it could have a different class of service. And uh, then thus it follows uh, the path of uh, their um, trigger packet. And uh, one of the advantages is that uh, it overcomes their MTU limitation, so it can um, actually have no bound by the amount of information can be collected because what HTS protocol does, it constructs the sequence of uh, packets that carry uh, relevant uh, telemetry information. Next slide. Uh, also, the uh, HTS can be used in a um, multicast environment without unnecessary uh, multiplication and duplication of information collected upstream. So you can see here, it's just uh, an example of how it works in a multicast environment. And next slide. So, and as well as it can work uh, upstream, so uh, the packets will traverse back uh, the path of being traversed by the trigger packet. So I, I use my time and uh, that was just to refresh the memory. And as I mentioned, uh, again, I appreciate all the comments uh, that uh, um, was received during the working group adoption poll and uh, uh, I will work on addressing them shortly. Thank you. Any questions, comments on that? All right. Well, thank you for the summary again, and we look forward to the updated version. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Nalini. Uh, next, please. Yep. This is going to be really short. Um, we had uh, sent the draft over to SecDeer for an early review, and it came back. They had a bunch of suggestions. Uh, they said um, they wanted us to change how we were doing the attacks and use the limited threat model uh, RFC uh, to address it that way. So we have done that. Same thing for privacy considerations is um, uh, the way had, we had formatted it was not, um, uh, could have been done better. So we did that also too. For our encryption, we had not uh, picked a default cipher suite. Uh, we have since uh, done that. And uh, there were a number of other simplifications for um, citing, like doing things like there's no need to repeat stuff that's already defined in HPKE. We did that. And um, so now we're going to go ahead and get another SecDeer review. And that's that's where we are. And any thoughts, questions? Otherwise, as I say, we're just looping through SecDeer. Have people in the room read the latest update after this? Any hands of, yes, you have? 
Yeah. Okay. So I think we want to encourage folks to do a review of that. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe just like in, in parallel with kicking off another sector, we can, as the chairs kind of ask that people review that. And I, where, where do you think you are in terms of getting towards a working group last call? I feel like we're pretty good. What yeah. I want to do like, is- I Would wanna... we want to do that like in parallel with the sector, do you think? Well, that's a very good question, is what I'd like to do, if you guys are okay with it, is have uh, this the reviewer yes. do a private review in case, you know, because we asked him to clarify what he, you know, that I just want to make sure we understood what he said. So have him do just one final look over, then we'll officially, and, and once he says, yes, you've understood what I, I said. Think. Yeah. And then we'll ask for a formal sector review. And then I suppose we could call for last call. We have an implementation that we've been working on side by side. So, so yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't know what your thoughts are. Okay. Uh, and as far as just confirming with the previous sector review, is that something that the authors will just directly yes. ask them for? Great. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. I will just talk to them. Directly. Okay. Great. Yep. So maybe once that's done, mm -hmm. we'll then we can kick off and perfect. everything. You just email the terrorist directly. Okay. Yep. Sounds perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. Anybody want to? We, yeah, we're happy to share our implementation with anybody too. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's an eBPF. <laughs> uh, for the implementation status, so you have that, which is great. Um, are there other folks working on implementations as well? Or you is know, this just kind of like a, a one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's really super interesting because we have seen PDM being used in the wild where we did not expect it. And, you know, I, I wonder. Um, I suppose, does IPPM have a, a, you know, like a wiki where we post implementations? We might want to, I don't know if you don't. We, we, I we don't haven't know. done that formally as a whole working group. Now, what we have done, because we can tag uh, specific documents with uh, a link to either you know, a, a wiki or list of related implementations, or you know, direct links to a GitHub page or whatever else for that that are labeled as implementations. We've done that for things like the responsiveness project. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly encourage doing that as one thing that we can point to, particularly you know during the Shepherd write up and IETF last call, saying like, look, here are the implementations. Here's the documentation of that. And I think this goes for all of the documents we do yeah, yeah. Um, in general. But that that would be good if no, we want no, to yeah. use that tool. Yeah, no, we'll do, we'll do that because we've talked to the EBPF people too. It's a little, it, it like the cipher it suites and stuff gets a little, gets a little headachey, yeah. but, but it's a lot of fun. So, yep. So anything else then? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Getting some time back too. Justin. Hello, everyone. Um, so this is an update on the uh, uh, integrity of IOM data fields. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this one is going to be pretty quick, actually. So um, there is only some, you know, editorial changes since the last time in San Francisco. Uh, mainly, um, one sentence that was added in um, the threads description based on an email we received uh, privately. And the other one is um, to add, you know, the last code point uh, about the integrity uh, option type for the DEX. So based on the IANA conversation, we removed the label suggested next to the code point. But the most important point is maybe this one that we're still waiting for a secondary review. So we were not as lucky as Nelly near. <laughs> um, so what I suggest, if I may, is mm -hmm. maybe to have, you know, a working group last call in parallel that could force, you know, people to read the draft. Because if I remember well, um, we had like one or two people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not that much. Um, and so maybe we could receive, you know, the review in parallel or with the last call, so I think we sh probably should proceed right now. No. Uh, the other thing, b besides uh, re-asking 
the uh, sector reviewer, which we've asked several times, um, is we could just ask the security director to assign a different reviewer in this case, um, which, which I think would be fine to do. So maybe we can take a note of the action that we, we may want to do that and ask for a new reviewer. Appreciate. Okay. So that's it. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Responsiveness. I think, you know, since people are here this week, um, we can take the action to reach out to the security ADs or sector and just figure out what, the, if there will be a way to move it along faster. And if we can get that soon and get that input, great. Um, and I, I think we can just decide when's the right time to do the last call. I, I think we, we should do the last call before the next IETF. Either way, um, ideally getting the sector review as soon as possible, but potentially having it be in parallel. Shall I start? Uh, I'm Stuart Cheshire. I'm here speaking on behalf of my co-author, Christoph Parrish, who is back in California, mm -hmm. where it's the middle of the right middle of the night right now. Just you can do it for me. Um, short answer is uh, we think we're done with this draft. Uh, it's been through a few rounds of reviews and good feedback and suggestions, both in the wording uh, and in the algorithm. We started this work uh, in 2020 when lots of people were working at home because of the pandemic and Video calls didn't work very well, and uh, that's now three years ago, and we think it's time to move this forwards. Uh, I think it's ready for working group last call. I think it's important that we advance this, uh, and I'll, I should explain why. For the last 20, 30 years of networking development, we have all, everybody in this room, has used iPerf to measure the throughput of their network connections. You upgrade from 10 megabit ethernet to 100 megabit, or you pay more money to your ISP to upgrade from 100 megabit to 500 megabit at home. What is the first thing you do? You do a speed test to see if you're getting what you paid for. Um, even though we should know better, we're all guilty of that. I did it too. And uh, in the last few years, when those of us working on improving network user experience, and that means consistent low round trip time uh, when the network is busy, not just when it's idle. Idle networks always have a low round trip time. It's not difficult to do that. You've got to be really trying hard to do it badly for your idle network to have a bad round trip time. But maintaining a good round trip time when it's busy is the challenge, and, and we know how to do that. Uh, when we talk to engineers at chip companies who make Wi-Fi chips, Assuming we can explain the issues to them and they get on board and they, they agree that it's important to fix it and they agree on how to fix it, what we realized is that they need a tool to tell whether they've done the fix correctly. Because when they say to their management, we're going to change how we design the Wi-Fi chip because it'll make it better, they need an objective measure. And that's why we... Uh, we could have just written a tool and, and, and shipped it, but we actually wanted the feedback of the whole ITF community to get agreement that this is a useful measure. The number it reports is a good correlation with subjective user experience, and we wanted there to be multiple implementations. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, I think we've achieved all of those things. We've had lots of discussions. We've lots, had lots of feedback and refinements. We now have three different independent implementations. Uh, those of you with Macs have one built in already that uh, is ships by default. There are also two open source ones available for other platforms. And we want to make this tool available to engineers working in the, uh, in the industry, designing hardware, uh, when uh, organizations like the FCC are creating regulations around 
what does it mean to call something broadband? Right now, their definitions are all in terms of throughput. Is it 100 megabits? Is it 200 megabits? And I think everybody in this room knows that it's not just about throughput latency matters as well. But the FCC cannot make any sensible regulations unless they have a measurement tool to point to that actually gives an objective measure. So that's why I think it is very timely right now that we uh, move this ahead to publication. So that's my request that we can uh, see if there's agreement on starting a last call on this. Yeah, thank you. It's great to see the progress of this document and that we're in the state. Oh, we have Lucas in the queue, so please. Hi, I'm Lucas Pardu. I just want to say, like, this is great work. I've been reviewing the document as it's been going. I have a few open issues, but I think we should just try and address those during the working group last call process. Uh, if you have open issues that you have time to type up this week, then I think we'll try to incorporate that and, and get a, a, a zero four out, and, and then we can use that as the basis for the last call. You got to give us something to do in last call. Well, we got to have some comments in there. <laughs> I, I've been wanting to, to offer some text of my own as well on that. Um, okay. Take, I've taken tasks and I just not have the cycle. So, um, so let's, uh, I mean, I'm willing to sit down with you this week while, while we're in the same place. Um, uh, I think uh, we should improve the document. Um, I want the document to have all the feedback and to be in the most readable state so that when everybody else is reading it, they're not pointing out the same nits and the same mistakes. So, so let's try to get that done in the next few days and kick off yeah. the last call. If we can, and I just don't want to block progress. I think it's ready, and I think it's in a really good shape, and it's good work. So. Well, it's Tuesday now. We have until Friday, so let's get it done. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Oh, we got a couple. So, Kiridi? Um, sorry, I haven't read the document. But I did wonder if this is going to be used more formally. Is it possible, has anyone done the analysis of gaming the system? So pretend or <clears throat> doing something that appears to give good results on a network that is actually not so good. Uh, uh, that is a really important point. Uh, I'm going to make the obvious request is please read the document and, and give us the feedback if you think it doesn't explain that. But the point you're making was something that was really important to us right at the start. And it's the reason we took certain decisions that might have seemed odd to some people. We don't measure the round trip time using ICMP echo precisely because there are no applications that communicate their data in ICMP echo packets. When you look up the weather forecast for Prague, it's coming in an HTTP GET. It's not coming in ICMP ECHO. Yeah. So, so the test does an HTTP GET to measure the end, the, the application layer end user round trip time to actually get data from a server. So it includes TLS overhead, TCP overhead, um, uh, and those overhead shouldn't be big, but but they are included. And, and so, by by accelerating uh, ICMP. I'm not helping this. Uh, exactly. If, yeah, if, if, if the benchmark was using ICMP, that gives an incentive for vendors to cheat. And they might not even cheat knowingly. These things can happen yeah, sort of yeah. inadvertently because some manager says to some engineer, um, our score is too low on this text test, make the score better. Right. And the engineer figures out that prioritizing ICMP makes the score higher. Yeah, they've have... done what they were asked to do. Right. But, but it doesn't, doesn't help, help end users. Exactly. So we try to create a test where the only way to game it is to provide really good internet service. And if that's how you game the test, then we both win. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I will read the draft. All right. Um, I put myself in queue just for a question on the update. One of the ones you mentioned was about the, uh, the well-known URI, um, which is good. I'm glad we have it. Just as far as the like the name for that, you know, it's like a very NQ. short NQ, very brief and concise. Um, I just wondered, uh, how did we pick that? Do we know, like, have we talked to the, the experts for the well-known URI? Is that something that, um, is that the, you know, 
The second they, question they I can't question. answer, okay. have we talked to the experts? Um, uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm actually not sure who those experts are. As to why we picked that, we, uh, we didn't want to call it latency under load or working latency or other variations on that because our goal is to measure network quality. And the focus in version one of the tool is uh, application layer responsiveness under normal network working conditions. In other words, sharing the network with capacity seeking flows. That is an important thing. It's maybe not the most important. Uh, it's not the only important thing. It probably is the most important thing, but not the only important thing. So as this evolves, I can imagine the network quality tool measuring other aspects of network behavior, like does it support IPv6? Does it? Uh, we could make a long list of things that we believe make for a good network. Does it support path MTU discovery? And in this community, in this working group, we could figure out some weighted average to put all those numbers together into some aggregate network quality score. So the intention is that when you fetch the JSON blob from this well-known URI, right now you get back the configuration about how to do the responsiveness test, but that could be involved in a backwards compatible way over time to, to do the other testing that we want. So that's that's kind of yeah. the idea. It's a future proof okay. game. Makes sense. Um, so I did look up, so Mark Nottingham is the one expert on that. Okay. Um, so it may be worth just talking, like I, looking at the current registry there, there are some that use very abbreviated names and some that write it out. And you know, since a URI is not necessarily a constrained space, I'm just wondering, like, could it just be network dash quality, or just maybe worth asking in case there's any for, opinion? For, for, for the DNS serve discovery service type, it was NQ oh, okay. because those names are more constrained to be 14 characters yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or fewer. Yeah. Uh, and I think this was picked to be the same for consistency, okay. which and that might be a, enough argument to keep it the same. Uh, Mark, Nottingham. Mark Nottingham, chair of HTTP BIS, I think. Yes, he is. All right. Cool. Thank, you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so I think. Yes. Uh, who's up, Greg? Again. So, Yang, stamp. <laughs> Okay, please help me. Okay, um, next. Okay, so um, the document temporarily expired, but I appreciate the Rakesh uh, taking effort and uh, it's a real example of community service reviewing expired document. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, as well, Rakesh agreed to join as a co-author on this work. So uh, we'll now work together uh to improve it uh i have renewed the document it's not final uh but it already has uh some uh constructs that i think that will be useful in the model and uh, i appreciate your inputs uh take a look uh these are uh related to uh our agreement to include um stamp extensions uh into the model so that's our extra padding, uh, class of service, direct measurements, uh, um, HMAC, TLV, uh, what else? Um, uh, access uh, reporting, uh, location TLV. So uh, these are uh, all in, uh, I think it's RFC 8972. So uh, that we agreed that uh, will be a part of the Stamp Yang uh, model. And uh, as I mentioned, so uh, we'll work on it and uh, not let it expire again. Okay, so uh, so you see that uh, features listed that I mentioned and uh, all of them are now uh, formed as a container. But again, this is work in progress. So uh, take a look at the latest version and uh, share your comments in the list. Yeah, next. Next. So, 
just uh, these are examples. It's it's not uh, everything that's there. there are more changes. Okay, so um, and hopefully we'll have uh, the good stable version uh, before their uh, next meeting, and uh, we'll ask for Yang doctors review. We had an early Yang doctors review. Uh, I believe that those uh, comments should be addressed, but uh, now need to do uh, stamp ex extensions properly. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions, comments on this work? Otherwise, people, please uh, have a look at the document now, make your reviews, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing Reviews, you. comments, questions, yep. and still open for cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to stamp IOM. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Rakesh Gandhi, and um, I'm presenting this uh, zero zero version of the draft. Uh, uh, it's a stamp extension for IOM. So IOM had uh, this active measurement um, um, text in the in the RFCs, and this is basically using stamp uh, 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 for IOM. Uh, there are um, many generic applicability of it uh, as well. Uh, so we'll. Uh, look at it. Uh, there is some good discussion on the mailing list as well. So next slide, please. So agenda, we'll look at the requirements and scope, uh, summary of the procedure and the next steps. Next slide, please. So requirements is, it is uh, the performance measurement using uh, STEM. Um, it's basically uh, leveraging the IOAM uh, work that's done by this working group uh, to do, you know, hop by hop or edge to edge measurements. Uh, the goal is to leverage the existing implementation that's out there. Uh, STAMP has a requirement for uh, a symmetric packet size until the work that uh, Greg completes for the asymmetric. Um, we try to avoid the uh, protocol extensions for IPv6, uh, PLS side, um, and we make the STAMP TLV generic uh, such that uh, we uh, kind of future proof it for all the um, extension headers in IPv6 and MPLS. The, the scope is uh, STAMP, STAMP extension, uh, uh, IPv6 uh, options, and then PLS uh, MNS substacks. So there are various IPv6 options uh, that's applicable, uh, including the IOM or alternate marking or the uh, slicing uh, for IPv6 and MNA. Uh, how they are used, we, we can discuss it uh, uh, later. Next slide, please. So this is an example for the IPv6 uh, data plane. Uh, so idea is uh, is fairly uh, simple, uh, straightforward. Uh, it's symmetric uh, stamp packet size. So basically, sender will add empty stamp TLV. Uh, these are uh, uh, just the same size as the IPv6 options in this example, and is empty uh, because the reflector will copy the data from the uh, options into that and uh, send it back to the uh, sender. So this is uh, a way to get. Uh, IOM data from the forward path back to the sender. Um, and again, uh, the reflector will add uh, options in the reverse direction as well. So this is the very basic uh, um, uh, idea. Uh, next slide, please. And works the same way for MPLS data plane. Uh, there is an MNA substack uh, uh, extension header kind of work. It's a working group document. So we would do the same thing with the MPLS data plane as well. Next slide, please. So there, there, there were good discussions uh, on the mailing list. Uh, first comment, uh, uh, Greg mentioned that uh, uh, maybe we want to do the measurement in the forward direction, but not in the reverse direction. Uh, so there is uh, some uh, work that uh, Greg is doing as part of asymmetric packets uh, with the reflected test packet control TLV. So uh, one idea is that uh, we can add a sub TLV and say uh, it's an extension header control uh, sub TLV. So reflector will only insert those uh, uh, extension headers if it's uh, requested to do so, otherwise it won't. So this is one idea, it's not in the draft uh, and welcome your um, comments on that. Uh, good thing about this approach is that stem packet size is still uh, symmetric in both directions. Uh, next uh, slide please. Uh, there is another comment uh, uh, from uh, Xiaomin. 
uh, basically uh, uh, to say why not combine uh, uh, stamp TLVs into one big stamp TLV instead of having it per, per op, uh, IPv6 option, for example. Um, the other comments uh, or the, uh, the, the discussion is that maybe reflector doesn't want to reflect all of the extension headers or sender doesn't want reflector to reflect all of them. And it will only insert the empty TLVs for which it needs the data back. Uh, so uh, this was uh, the uh, idea uh, uh, suggested as well. Uh, if you have any comments on that, uh, please let us know. This is not in the draft. So both comments we have not addressed yet. It's still under discussion. And next slide, please. So if you go, if we would have two uh, uh, um, uh, INR requests. One is the empty stamp TLVs uh, for IPv6, one and one for MNA. And another would, if you go with the asymmetric uh, uh, packet, it's still an individual draft, but if you go with it, uh, then we would have a sub TLV for it for the extension header control. So we have Shaman in the queue. Do you want to take your question now or do you want to take questions to it at the end? I or? think this might be the last uh, slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, let's take the question uh, before we go there. Uh, Shomin, uh, please. Ah. Hello, uh, Shomin from CTE. Uh, uh, as I uh, re replied on the mailing list, uh, I I'm not convinced that uh, the multiple uh, stamp TOVs uh, uh, is the better choice for uh, this function. Uh, I can think of an uh, uh, application scenario. Uh, if I'm a stamp session a sender and I want uh, the session reflector to uh, reflect some uh, fields uh, outside of the uh, just like uh, IPv6 option, uh, like uh, IPv6 uh, flow label, and uh, how can uh, this mechanism work for that scenario? Because I want to monitor the flow label and the relationship between the flow label and uh, the actual uh, forwarding path uh, of the stamp test packet. How can I uh, achieve that? So I think um, uh, th it's a good discussion and Tianan is also uh, here. So maybe we can have a, a meeting with three of us and we can uh, make progress uh, that way. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I hear you. I understand uh, your your um, comments. Uh, it's a good comment, by the way. Thanks. So, just wanted to take this opportunity to also uh, socialize the uh, couple of other drafts uh, for Stamp. Uh, there's one in the spring uh, where we have a, a extension to uh, use Stamp. There, uh, there's lookback mode defined for Stamp as well as NS lookback mode which is uh, adding timestamp and forward the packet, Sim something like IOM concept there. It's an interesting uh, uh, extension there. Uh, and the second draft is uh, the using uh, the, for MPLS, uh, generic association channel types defined. Uh, we are presenting the draft in MPLS session on Thursday. Uh, so both drafts uh, welcome your uh, uh, comments and suggestions. Um, next slide, please. So thank you, Greg, uh, Tianran, uh, Xiaomin, uh, for your comments and suggestion. Um, Tianran has agreed to join as co-author, so welcome, Tianran. Uh, we'll update the draft with the suggestions. Uh, there are some good comments, uh, so we'll update them. And, but welcome your additional comments and suggestions, uh, and uh, we would be seeking a working group adoption for it. Right. Um, that sounds like a good time to do this. So we can start by just uh, a simple show of hands in the room here, like how many people have read this document already? Okay, that's quite a bit. So let's do, uh, I'm gonna use the show of hands tool to see, to let people indicate whether you think this uh, work is uh, uh, is useful to adopt in the IPPM working group, so. In the tool? In the tool yeah, yeah, in the tool. Uh, let me just. Show of hands. 
see if this works now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please indicate whether you think this document is ready for working group adoption. And uh, if you don't click anything, it means you have no opinion. So you're defaulting to that. We'll give a little bit more time. Five, two. So the sense we get that there is quite some favor of adopting this, but we have two people who, who clicked no here. It would be very interesting to see if you have any comments you want to make about this uh, as to why. Sorry? Uh, it's uh, five yes, two no, and 54 without opinion. <laughs> okay, Richard Foot. Hey, uh, Footer, Nokia. I like the work. I like where it's going, but I think it's too early to adopt it, personally. I think it's got a ways to go. You've got some comments still to discuss and some work to do. So I just think it's a bit early. I like the work. Okay, so you think the it's too much work to handle through an adoption call? And, I, I yeah. think it's too early. Okay, this uh, that, that's useful feedback. Yeah. Anything you want to say about that? Or? Um, so we have a couple of comments that's uh, under discussion on the mailing list. So we'll resolve that and we'll update the draft and um, we'll come back with uh, the revision. Right. So, so that, that would be a good approach that, yeah, uh, handle these comments, provide a new revision, and then we can talk about when it's appropriate for yeah, adoption sure. call. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have stamp extensions for hop by hop. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm presenting on behalf of the co-authors about the stamp extension for hop by hop data collection. So next slide. Yeah, what is the motivation for this draft? You all know the stamp RFC and that enables uh, active measurement of one way around trip performance between a server and a reflector. Anyway, the performance of the intermediate nodes are not available. So considering the reference model uh, defined in the RFC 8762, we want to add a new element that is the intermediate nodes. This document, therefore, this document introduced optional TLVs to enable this hop by hop performance measurement on each intermediate node. Um, and the format follows, of course, the extended TLV uh, according to the RFC 8972. Uh, next slide. Yeah, these are the TLVs that uh, the documents define. So the information is collected uh, at each intermediate node and then sent back by the reflector to the sender. We, uh, we started with four uh, TLVs, the hop by hop delay TLV, the times to record the ingress and egress timestamp at every intermediate node, the hop by hop loss TLV that records the number of test packets received and transmitted by every intermediate node, the hop by hop bandwidth TLV that records the bandwidth utilization, and the interface errors TLV. Of course, this is only a first proposal. We are open to add additional TLVs or to improve that one. So we are open for feedback. Uh, of course, this TLV can be activated se selectively according to the need and what we want to monitor. So um, we don't need to active all the TLVs together. Uh, next slide. So yeah, in a few words, if we have a stamp succession between a sender and a, and, a, and a reflector, and we have different intermediates node, if the intermediates node uh, can handle the, um, these extensions, the draft introduced the stamp with hop by hop capabilities in order to measure the different hop by hop delay for each intermediate node and link. What are the, the advantages? This simplify the configuration of the node on the path. And also, it is quite collector independent because the add node can quickly get the collected data. Uh, next slide, I think, is the last one. Yeah, just uh, the changes about from the latest version. So we had some comments at, in San Francisco and on the list. Uh, the draft has been revised to cover 
only the stamp extension because in the first version we all, we we also covered the IOM uh, data extension, but now the IOM data is covered by the draft that was presented previously. So we clearly separate the scope and focus only on the hop by hop extension here. Next slide. Okay, yeah, comments are welcome and yeah. Yeah, this is Frank. I have one quick one and I've not read the draft, but uh, how do you do integrity protection for the TOVs? Um, for now, we we consider the security of stamp. Of course, this is something that needs to be improved, the security part. And yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, yes, uh, I agree with Giuseppe. Um, uh, stamp has uh, HMAC TLV that can be used for TLV uh, identity protection. So it doesn't have to be. Um, stamp authenticated mode. So basically stamp can be used in unauthenticated mode with HMAC TLV using to protect uh, TLVs. But um, I have a different question. So since, as you mentioned that uh, you intend to uh, discuss IAM use, use of stamp and IAM in combination in a separate document. So how you envision that stamp supports hub by hub because uh, um, although stamp can have a destination port of well-known 682 over UDP it's as well uh, can be used from the Martian ports uh, range so basically then uh, how the transit node will uh, recognize that this is a TOV packet uh, stamp packet we, we didn't define this yet, but I think that it can be configured. As for the stamp RFC, the base stamp RFC, um, let's say we can add this new element and by configuration, we can define that this new intermediate node can listen on that part and can be configured to handle that kind of TLB. Yeah, because, you know, uh, when, my, my understanding of this proposal, uh, when it combined with IAM, I thought that IAM provides this hub by hub uh, telemetry information. But if you foresee that it will be a different document, then uh, I think that it will be, be good to have a more clear uh, explanation of how you want to do hub by hub with the stamp and alone. Because I agree. I agree. That's why in the figure I put mm -hmm. the intermediates node in the stamp framework to see that the intermediates node need to be part of the stamp extension okay. in order to to be configured to read the TLVs. Otherwise, I agree with you. It's something that also for security uh, yeah. issue. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So let, let's see next versions. Thank yeah. you. Let's discuss. Um, Wolfgang Beck, I have a related question. Who sets the egress timestamp? Is it the control plane or the data plane? Or who is supposed to set this timestamp in, in hop? On hop by hop, on, on hop the intermediate hop. nodes? Um, it also depends on the implementation on the intermediate node. We can consider that it yeah, can it's be. It's quite complex for the data plane to get into a TLV yeah. uh, somewhere in the packet. So. If you put it in the control plane, it's not accurate. So. Yeah, sh sh probably should be control plane, but it's up to the implementation. So for now, we, we didn't investigate this part of the problem, but of course, yeah, we can consider it. All right, thank you. If no more comments, then thanks a lot for presenting this. I think there are some interesting issues to keep working on, and uh, we look forward to see more updates of this document. I think it would be interesting to, to think a little bit about the security properties and yeah. how to handle authentication and integrity protection. And yeah, okay. good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have quality of outcome.
Uh, there's Wolfgang in the queue. Was that a comment on the previous? Or you're fine, yep. Let's just remove you. Yes, all right, thank you. Um, my name is Bjorn Ivar I work with the Domos, it's a latency management company. And I'm here to present uh, two drafts, actually. So next slide, please. Uh, these are just the links. So next slide. OK, so this is the first, uh, the first draft. The title is uh, Requirements for a Network Quality Framework Useful for Applications, uh, Users, and Operators. And the objective of this is to outline basically the essential features uh, that such a framework will have to have to meet the needs of these three different stakeholders. And as we see it, uh, the main needs of these three stakeholders are for the end users to have something that is easy to understand and int intuitive. So a simple score of the network quality. For application developers, um, we think the, the most important point is to have something um, to have a language to express requirements so that if, because different applications have different network requirements, there needs to be a way for those differences to be articulated and for those specified requirements to be compared to actual network measurements. And then for operators and vendors, we think that having something that is useful for troubleshooting and optimization are the most important points. So what this document does is to list a bunch of different network quality metrics and evaluate them on these different requirements. And we conclude basically there are no frameworks that capture all of these needs at the same time. And we identify a metric that is doing a very good job at, at the operators and vendors part. So it has troubleshooting and, and optimization uh, sort of figured out already, uh, but it's uh, lacking on application developers and end users. And uh, that brings basically brings us to the next uh, draft. So next slide, please. I'll go into a little bit of the, the metric that we identify as, as a good potential to build on, which is the broadband forum standard um, on quality attenuation. And this standard specifies a quality metric, how to measure it, and how to report it. Um, it has, in my opinion, two features that are, are very desirable. Uh, the first is that it's composable. So you can measure different segments and add them up. Or you can measure the end-to-end -end and split it up. So the, And that's a, a very a good feature to have if you want to identify uh, <coughs> the specific link or component in a chain that added uh, or that contributed most to an end-to-end -end problem, or if you want to analyze the effects of upgrading parts of your end-to-end -end chain. And the other very useful uh, feature in addition to composability is uh, that it's based on probabilities. And that's important because some network technologies are inherently random, like Wi-Fi. And others are, from the point of view of a single application or user, they are effectively random because your performance is affected by the behavior of all the other users of that component or link or router or whatever, whatever it is. And so the best we can do in terms of describing the behavior of that component is to model the distribution of, uh, of likely outcomes, basically. So this uh, quality metric is both composable and uh, based on probabilities, which, in our opinion, are uh, make for a good uh, foundation for uh, this this framework that we want to work with you on. So next slide, please. So this is basically the project for the quality of outcome uh, draft. We want to find a middle ground between this quality of service, uh, how like measured specific metrics in the network and uh, the quality of experience of the end user. That involves uh, two steps. We have to figure out how applications can express or how to express the needs of different applications, whether that is um, us making that uh, choice or the applications themselves, it doesn't matter. There has to be a language 
to express network requirements in a way that can be compared to the actual measurements taken in the network. And then we want to make that so, so that we can both do that and also create a very simple score that we can present to the end users and say, like, this is the summary of what we, what we found. So next slide, please. So this is the, the, the details of what we are proposing. And before I describe what you're looking at, I, I want to emphasize that this is our first attempt and a suggestion for how this can be done. And we recognize that we can't do this alone and we shouldn't try to do this alone, which is why we are uh, bringing it to IPPM. Uh, we want feedback from the community, from uh, application vendors, from, from people working on network quality from, from the entire ecosystem uh, to contribute so that we can make it work in uh, as many different scenarios as possible. So what you're looking at here is a um, on the x-axis we have latency, and then on the y-axis is a CDF. And the blue line is is the measured delay or quality attenuation, if you will, of of a link. And so that's the actual measurement from the network. And then the application language for describing the requirements are visualized here as these black horizontal lines. And the idea is that if the measured delay is lower than the 100 on each of these lines, then we say that the application is happy with the network. The application uh, basically says that if the network is this good or better, then we can assume that the network is not degrading the, the user experience. And then on the other far end on the right side, uh, where the zeros are, is basically the application saying if the network is this bad or worse, then we are absolutely sure that the network is now causing issues and uh, the, the end user is having a bad time, basically. So, so the, the language for the application requirements here is basically a list of, of for each percentile or for a set of percentiles, what is the perfect and what is the useless uh, latency, <laughs> and then different applications can choose different percentiles here uh, and dif different thresholds for each of them. So this is a very flexible way to express uh, requirements and it can be compared directly to the latency distribution of the actual measure measurements taken uh, in the network. All right, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, go back. I forgot one thing. <laughs> uh, and the way we, we can translate this, so here we have the the quality measurement, we have the application requirement, and then the way we arrive at something that is intuitive to, to the end user is basically looking at if the measured, if the blue line, the measured delays are worse than perfect, but better than useless. So that means it crosses at least one of these lines at some point, then we basically just take that point, uh, interpolate between 100 and 0, and report that as a score. Um, and that gives you a nice 0 to 100 number to report to the end user, saying this is how good your network is right now. Next slide, please. So this is the implementation stat status. We have uh, a C library, and we have uh, an implementation in the Go responsiveness client that Will Hawkins is maintaining, uh, which also does the, the responsiveness metric that Stuart was talking about. Next slide, please. And this, these are some other implementations that we have uh, made at Domos. So we have in the Teams, Teams has an app store. Um, and if you go to the Teams App Store and search for Network X-Ray, uh, you will find an app that measures your network quality alongside your team, Teams calls, calculates this score uh, for a network requirement that we've worked out ourselves, um, basically shows you your network quality in real time. And if the other people on your call also has the app installed, then their scores are reported as well. So you basically get real time network quality for each of the participants in the call. Um, and then we also have the same thing for uh, Chrome, as a Chrome extension. 
So if you go to the Chrome uh, extension the store or whatever, uh, search for Network X-Ray, you'll find this plugin that pops up in your Meet calls or WebEx or Zoom and uh, shows you the quality of your network connection. And so this is just to show that we are using this with, with some applications um, and we are trying to tune everything so that it, it, uh, the, the score that we observe actually translates well into the user experience and we're having some, some good early results uh, with that. Okay, um, next slide please. So we propose a working group adoption call for this and we welcome all contributions and criticism and questions. And um, yeah, I, I'm excited to, to work with the, the IPPM group on this. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And we did have, uh, okay, let's start with some questions and comments. We have Luis. Yeah. Hello, Luis from Telefonica. Well, one question, Bjorn. This would, could be useful also for measuring the impact of the terminals. Um, I mean, so because you are referencing continuously to the network part, but I guess that those, I mean, also the contributor or the, or the terminal, the PC or the, or the mobile and so could be also assessed with this kind of tool, right? Absolutely. Uh, if you can, if you can instrument it and do the timestamping at each point, uh, then yes, a any, any step in the end to end chain from the application to the server and everything in between adds delays or packet losses. And if you can count them, then you can use this framework, basically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, I have a uh, just a question, uh, not as a chair, just of curiosity, on, uh, on on your uh, score metric here. So here you show an example of crossing one of these lines. If you were to cross multiple lines, how would you calculate score? Would you would you would you sum up the interpolations or or? Good question. Uh, so the way we have chosen to do it now is to just take the worst one. Okay, yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. So, but that is, uh, we found that works fairly well, but it's, I wouldn't say that's uh, necessarily the um, the final version of that. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maran? Maran? We can't hear you. We can't hear you yet. All right. Um, okay, yeah, Madan, you might want to check your microphone. Alternatively, if you want to type into the chat, I can relay what you want to say here. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we're we're not able to hear you. So if um, oh, ran some video. Nope. Okay. Yeah. Uh, please either uh, drop something to the chat into the or uh, send an email to the list on that. Okay. Right. And just one other question I had, um, you know, I noticed like in the visualization of the tool you had, uh, you know, this network quality and earlier we heard from responsiveness, which is also calling it to the user as network quality. How do you see those things being complementary or not? Uh, and, and the difference is also in your mind, how you would describe that. Excellent questions. Um... So the way I see it is the responsiveness is an active test that you run. Um, I mean, you can run it uh, often if you want, but it's an active test. The, net, the network latency monitoring uh, that's uh, defined and, and standardized by the Roman Forum is designed to use a very low bitrate background flow or, or a few. Um, so that can be run like as a 24 seven monitoring thing. Um, and so they are complementary in that way, where the the responsiveness thing measures um, responsiveness during an active speed test, basically, to generate uh, congestion. Whereas this tool will work with basically monitoring latency alongside the background 
traffic that the user is generating for their just normal day-to-day internet uh, connectivity needs. C- could you calculate your you know quality of outcome <laughs> graph for a particular application with either data source though, like either a passive or like active? Does it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we can view it as that and. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you know, the graph you have here, these are based on parameters specific to this application, this application saying, I have these constraints, and therefore this is how I, successful I will be given the quality as opposed to having an overall quality of network score that is in application independent. Yes, that's a, that's a good point as well. Yeah. Okay. Stuart, would you like to? Um, you made a comment there, and I... Uh, I thought it was worth uh, adding on to that because it is something that comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, people, some people have got the impression that they they question the network quality test because it saturates the network, mm-hmm. and there are these other tests, like you say, the broadband forum can run twenty four hours a day in the background with a very low data rate. And um, I'm going to be, you know, sort of humorous here, but. Um, uh, the problem that a lot of people face is they're on a video conference call and they download an app and their video conference call goes to hell for 30 seconds because their network can't do two things at the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we have built a datagram-based packet switching network that's supposed to be able to share a network between multiple clients, but the reality today is it, it can't do more than one thing at a time. So... There are lots of these tests that I describe as they tell you how well your network works when you're not using it. And knowing that my network is great while I'm asleep and it only sucks when I'm using it isn't really helping me. 99% of the time, my network might be perfect. And if the only 1% of the time it sucks is when I'm doing stuff on it, being told it's 99% perfect is not helping me. So, So the network quality test is precisely focused on testing does this network stand up when you push it? Not does it work fine when it's not being pushed? So I yeah. just wanted to explain. I, I know you understand that, but just when this comes up, uh, I, I sometimes yeah. hear people get the impression, say, well, that's not a fair test. In fact, just last week, Greg White from Cable Apps was giving a talk at the Wi-Fi Alliance, and the response he got from the room is, well, you can't expect your network to work well while you're doing a download, right? <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree with Stuart as well on this. So. Yeah. Imagine if you are passively measuring at the 99 percentiles, if someone is downloading, like, that will be captured somewhere in your graph passively. But it, Yes, yeah. and I mean, the time scales of this does matter. If you, if you do one CDF for the entire like 24 hour of a day, then it's going to look better than it really is when it's at its worst. Mm-hmm. But you could do something like take the worst 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. or take the worst minute or something like that, depending on, on your use case, and then you'll get more uh, realistic results. Okay. Good. So we did have one adoption call for this work. Uh, and uh, I mean, last you presented it last ITF, and we saw quite some support in the room. Uh, we did an adoption call, and it was a little bit uh, of silence there. We got a very good review from Greg and good supporters that were very thankful. Uh, we would like to urge everyone who is interested in this work and who thinks this this work is useful for for the IPPM working group to to take on to to actually uh, re- read this uh, read this work and and uh, provide your feedback and we think we should reopen this adoption call again. Um, but please uh, please take the opportunity to read this work. Yeah. Thank you very much. And if anyone wants to discuss any part of this. Please reach out to me. I have uh, time to to spend talking on this. So, <laughs> thanks. And what's the next? Hello again. 
This is about the alternate marking deployment draft. So yeah, this is the first update after the first version. So next slide. Yeah, uh, just a few words about the background and motivation. You all know that the base documents about the alternate marking were already published as standard documents. So I can mention RFC 9341, 9342, and 9343 for the IPv6 option. Um, this draft aims to provide guidance for the real deployment since uh, sometimes when we talk about alternate marking in ITF, always people ask about deployment issue, how to deploy, how to manage. So this draft aims to, cl to clarify all these aspects related to the deployment domain, the measurement nodes, the type of measurements, and especially, so the main focus is about the manageability and configuration aspects and data export. So regarding the configuration, of course, you can use Young model, PSAP, BGP, and data export, we are working to the APFIX extension and to use Young push. Next slide. So yeah, the first, the, the main points uh, of this draft is to clarify the applicability in a controlled domain. This is already explained also in 9341 and 9343 according to uh, RFC 8799. And the, um, we also clarify that the typical deployment domain is normally an overlay network where traffic is encapsulated at one domain border and encapsulated at the other domain border. Um, the a domain, of course, consists in a marking nodes and an um, unmarking nodes that are the border router of a deployment domain. And we also have transient nodes. If you want to make a question, please. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, this is Frank. Yeah. So I think it, you probably remember the, the hoops that we went through with IOEM on limited domains. Yeah. Uh, 8799 is not an IETF document. It's an individual draft. Yeah, um, yes. And um, so the, the recommendation is to define your own controlled domain. So there's yeah, yeah, no we such did. thing as a limited domain and, and the likes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so given that there is little sympathy at the ISG level for 8799, I would strongly suggest that you no, no. Thank you. Thank do you for your own thing that instead of referring to a document that is not considered an IT. Thank you for pointing that, Matt. So we already it's did. It's more of a, of a kind of no, 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 no. what we no, went through, right? So it's more. No, it's good that pointed out because we have the same we had the same problem with the 9341 and 9343 and we definitely we have already defined the controlled domain in 9341 and 9343 if you look at the rfc 9341 that is a standard document we have defined and i know that you did for iom so and we have the same problem i just put crfc 8799 because it explains let's say why this kind of on path measurement should be done in a limited domain, but I fully agree with you. Thank yeah, you. I, I agree with uh, Frank that uh, the question of uh, limited domain comes up uh, too often in the discussions, and the best of my understanding, ISG plans to do something about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one short comment. Try to make use of the queuing tool when you get up to speak, because it helps, yeah. Yeah, again, uh, also to answer Greg's point, Matt, uh, we already addressed this point in the alternate marking RFC. So we already explained, and maybe we can reuse that definition without referencing any more uh, RFC 8799. So um, to continue with this slide, um, we also explain the type of measurement that can be done by using one flag and two flags. So, and what um, is the measurement that we can do. And in particular, we um, define the kind of information that can be derived, the measurement frequency and the computational load in order to give also um, more tools, more uh, information to decide whether it's better to use one flag or two flags. Next slide. Yeah, regarding the configuration aspects, we basically reference the work that uh, we are proposing in IPPM as well, and is a lightning talk later, uh, that is the young model that can be used for the definition of the alternate mark data uh, for NetConf or SConf. 
and also the control plane mechanism to achieve these uh, capabilities. So in particular, we are working in IDR for the SR policy for BGP extension, the BGP IFIT capability extension and the PCEP extension. Regarding data export, we are, um, we are also proposing the IP fix extension in OPSA VG, but I guess also IPPM should review this draft. Uh, in addition to Epifix, also Young Push can be used. Um, we also specify that an additional information that must be included in the data export is the period number in order to make the collector uh, aware of the period ID. And this can allow the, the correlation aspect of the marking. Of course, we also add uh, more information about the available encapsulations and security aspects. Uh, again, uh, don't worry about RFC 8799. I will. <laughs> uh, okay, next slide. Um, yeah, just uh, I summarized the change from the 00 version. So we got several reviews and comments from Chong Feng, Greg, Thomas, uh, and Massimo. Um, we uh, the new section in, on configuration, we revised also the part on data export uh, and new section also in uh, implementation parts. Uh, next slide. Okay, yeah, well, we consider that this draft is uh, quite uh, useful. Uh, there is also a related draft uh, where there is IOM deployment. So we believe that this draft is also important be because give the full picture of the deployment part. So uh, a reader and possible people that is interested in this methodology can have a single document with all the information about the deployment. So comments, inputs, suggestions are always welcome. So thank you. All right, we have Martin in the queue. Martin Duke, Google. Um, so, do you guys have a like a data plane for this yet? Because I mean, I remember ninety three forty one, and it was, you know, here's a way that protocol developers could add these bits if they wanted to add them. Yeah, the do data we have some? Has somebody actually added them? The, the data plane is the RFC ninety three forty three. That is the IPv six extension. Okay, that can be used for IPv six and for SRV six. We are also, that is RFC that is already published. Okay, so there's an extension document. header that's deploying these bits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are okay. also other extensions, but they are already, they are still in progress, not yet progressed as RFC. So the only, let's say, data plane extension is the IPv6 extension. Okay. And the SRV6, of course. So I, mean, I, I just was looking at your laundry list of like stuff we're doing, and it, it's, <laughs> I kind of thought we had, we did a lot of those things in 1941. Like, a, a lot of like here are things you can measure. I mean, I mean, I mean obviously, I've obviously have not read your draft. Um, I'm a little disappointed that we just did 9341, and it feels like there's a lot of cleanup that needs to happen. Uh, it's my my impression from your talk without having read it, um, and that's un, that's not great, frankly. Uh, we, we, what we want to cover here is only the management, especially the management part, because, you know, if you, you have me a lot with 9341 yeah. and you know that we didn't cover how to configure, maybe yes. you also asked several times how to configure, how to export data. Okay. And this is what we want to address here. Explain how okay. to do. Of course, sometimes we also only had the pointer to other mm -hmm. drafts because we cannot define the IPv6 extension here, yeah. the Yang data yeah. model in this draft. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Doing Yang models is, is fine. Uh, like, the configuration is fine. There's a lot of bullets on one of those slides about things that you were, like, I read as being addressed in this draft, I thought were already addressed in 93.4x. But okay, thanks. Right. Um, could we have a quick show of hands? How many people here have read this document? Quite a few. So yeah, we could uh, consider uh, moving forward to a working group adoption call at some point. And yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, um, so uh, this is update uh, to the uh, work we presented first in San Francisco. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, their original thought was that uh, to do uh, control the reflected uh, uh, packet control from the uh, session stem session sender in order to uh, enable uh, rate measurement. Um, and for that, um, so we need to be able to variate uh, the size of the packet, so uh, different from their symmetric size, but the same uh, rate and number of packets uh, reflected by a uh, session reflector. Um, so uh, next slide. Uh, in, in the course of the discussion, uh, we realized that um, if we set the number of reflected packets to zero, then stamp turns in a one-way measurement protocol, and then uh, the data, uh, the measurement data, raw data, or process data can be uh, fetched or uh, processed according to local policy by the session reflector. So one interesting um, use case for this. Next slide. Um, um, Rakesh mentioned that, and we discussed it on the list um, uh, between the meetings that um, in combination with this uh, um, using uh, the return path uh, as a sub TOV for the reflected uh, test packet control TOV, uh, uh, the packet can reflect it to uh, what's characterized in LMAP architecture as a, a collector. So thus this information can be raw data uh, sent to the uh, collector for the uh, an, uh, network analytics in processing. Again, uh, might be interesting use case, optional. Next slide. Um, so the rate measurement, that was our primary interest in starting this work. And uh, as you can see, so uh, what's uh, expected of their uh, measurement mechanism by RFC 7497 uh, is uh, uh, this uh, extension is conforming to that. It provides uh, all the controls that are necessary to uh, do the rate measurement. Uh, next slide. So uh, as we uh, mentioned in um, uh, meeting in San Francisco, um, this extension can be used in uh, testing in a, a multicast environment. And uh, already that version that we discussed in San Francisco uh, has um, some uh, sub-TOVs uh, to do the filtering on layer two and layer three information uh, to minimize the amount of uh, responses being sent uh, to the session. Um, so in this um, version, we enhance their security considerations specifically for that. And one of them is that, um, their source, uh, the identity of the session sender must be uh, protected. Um, so that can be achieved by uh, several documents. For example, uh, session reflector can use uh, access control lists. Um, also, um, stamp can be used in authenticated mode or uh, HMAC uh, TLV can be used to protect uh, the integrity of their uh, TLV extensions, stamp extensions. Next slide. So uh, with that, I think that now the document is uh, more complete in order to just to present uh, their proposed solution. Uh, we welcome uh, your comments, reviews, and uh, uh, ask for your consideration of working group adoption. Thank you. We have Rakesh. Uh, Rakesh Gandhi, Cisco Systems. So I have read the draft. Uh, it's well written. I think it is ready for working group adoption. Uh, I have very two small comments. Uh, actually, thanks for addressing comments from the last uh, mm -hmm. ITF. One comment, if you go back to the slide for the one way. Um, yeah, it's very early. Yeah, yeah, this one. So it, we just uh, published RFC 9503 and it has a control code as well. And uh, I think it has a value that says if you set this value, then no reply packet is sent. 
So that's also another one way of uh, doing stuff. So just mm. to just to maybe uh, clarify the interactions and stuff. Oh, okay. Just wanted to highlight. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So this one is sending the the packet to a uh, uh, controller, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a security consideration. Uh, basically, um, um, the destination address uh, uh, is there is a tax in 9503. There are mm -hmm. two tax. One is that uh, the destination address is a local on the session sender. And then in the security uh, consideration, it says that uh, the address uh, that is uh, the destination address uh, that you send to uh, is controlled by an ACL uh, to avoid any uh, attack, mm -hmm. uh, a spoofing kind of stuff. So just to consider, uh, it, it is a valid use case. Uh, it's good. But just to say, mm -hmm. you may want to clarify yeah. the security. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we will look at this, but uh, we uh took example of your discussion in this uh newly published rfc congratulations by the way thank you and uh um so that's why we said that um their identity must be uh, protected but there are several uh me methods to do including acl including use of authenticated mode and including hmac tov for integrity protection of extension okay that's perfect yeah, mm -hmm. thanks thank you Wolfgang Beck, Deutsche Telekom. Um, if you look at stamp document, there's always this ominous management and control plane uh, above the stamp components. Um, why can't we use this control plane instead of using the stamp protocol itself for control of a yeah. starting a test? Um, that's a good question. Um, of course, yes. Uh, some can uh, think of argumenting stamp uh, uh, Yang model uh, to do um, this particular uh, mode of um, test session, but at the same time, th this is another option. So, you know, it's like there is not one way to slice the bread. Sure. <laughs> okay, but yeah, uh, absolutely. Your uh, your suggestion is a valid suggestion. Especially so, if, uh, with regard to the security requirements, yeah, you, if you have Yang, you have already or some other. Con configuration management plane, you have security measurements there, and you don't have to re-implement it in the, in the project. Um, well, actually, again, um, there are different approaches to uh, configuring a session reflector, because uh, some prefer to make uh, like a promiscuous mode uh, to creating uh, sessions on session reflector. So, without specifying explicitly uh, the identity of the session sender. So again, um, people prefer different ways of doing okay. things. So, but yeah, I agree. It can be done differently, not necessarily only one way. Rakesh? Uh, Rakesh, uh, just to answer, I think the one reason we did this written path uh, was uh, there is a stateful uh, reflector and there is a stateless reflector. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this thing uh, was for the stateless reflector. So you don't have a lot of states and a lot of uh, control. So th this is why this work uh, is, is useful for the stateless reflector. Right. It, I, I agree with Rakesh. So basically, it's uh, in, in, in a way, we can consider it to be this uh, using ex uh, options. Uh, to do uh, uh, data path, uh, so to control the test session uh, in a data plane, uh, similar to what's uh, being done with the service programming using uh, segment routing, for example. I don't know if this analogy works for you. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yeah. So. Again, uh, welcome comments and I appreciate your consideration working group adoption. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to the lightning talks sections. And uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Xiaoming from ZTE. Uh, this presentation is on uh, performance management for Geneva. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this draft uh, was submitted to NVF3 working group uh, and now it's moved to IPPM um, because uh, you know, uh, NVF3 working group uh, is keeping uh, the flow, is keeping low and uh, uh, in this draft, uh, uh, STAMP uh, is used uh, as the performance measurement uh, test packet uh, for GD uh, tunnel. So we move this work uh, in this working group. And uh, here you, uh, you can see uh, the encapsulation for stamp over IPUDP over uh, Geneva. And uh, in this draft, uh, in this figure, uh, the stamp uh, test packet can be a stamp session sender test packet or the stamp uh, session reflector uh, test packet. Uh, and for the uh, stamp session uh, demultiplexing, uh, if uh, stamp uh, session ID in the stamp uh, test packet uh, uh, equals to uh, zero, then uh, the Geneva uh, you, uh, VNI number and the uh, inner uh, IP header uh, should be used for the demultiplexing. Uh, if the uh, stamp session ID uh, is a non-zero uh, value, uh, then the stamp session ID uh, must be used uh, for the demultiplexing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, this figure shows the uh, stamp over uh, Ethernet IP UDP over Geneva uh, encapsulation. And uh, the stamp uh, demultiplexing mechanism is similar with the uh, last one. Uh, for details, uh, uh, please uh, read the draft. Next slide. Uh, yes, uh, we asked for more uh, reviews and comments, and we will revise this draft to remove it, uh, to improve it. and. Uh, maybe ask for a working group adoption then. Any uh, question, comment? No? Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, step again. Yeah. Hi again, I can be quite fast here. Uh, this is related to the previous draft on the deployment. So we aim to present the young data model for the alternate marking method. So next slide, I'm just prepared this slide. So yeah, what I want to highlight here, because there is already a draft on the young data model uh, that was proposed a few months ago, but um, we propose this new young data model just because we want to follow the same structure that was already consolidated with the IOM uh, young model. So we believe that following the same structure, we can in some way uh, facilitate the deployment of these on path telemetry methods. And since the, since the IOM data model has already been adopted, is approaching also the, uh, the publication. So we believe that following the, the same structure can help. Uh, the implementation. Um, just a few words about the, the detailed information. So of course we need to specify the profile name, the filter, the protocol type, the, the node action, the flow identification, the measurement mode, and if you want to enable loss measurement and delay measurement. So please review and any comments and input uh, are welcome. I want also to keep the occasion to invite the author of the other alternate marking data model to join this work and to join our effort to uh, put this work forward. So, thank you. Thank you. I, I'd be yeah, particularly curious to hear from Chamin as an author of the other document. Uh, yeah. Please. <laughs> uh, Shamin Ziti, uh, we have uh, submitted a uh, uh, young model for the alternate mark, you know it? Yeah, so, no, no, no. You mentioned it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. We, we can talk. Yeah, and, I, I mentioned, and I, I, I propose to merge, to work together, to move it forward. OK, yeah, okay. Yeah. that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and then, yeah, as chair, certainly support merging the efforts here. Um, however, I would note um, we have frequently had some uh, author count problems as we merge. So no we can... if we could please pick like one author from each document and have them be co-editors and maybe yeah. have two authors on the merge document, that would be fantastic. But please do uh, 
work together. And I think we would want to see a, a unified approach before we try to do any adoption here. Yeah, yeah we can manage that. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, yeah, this is uh, uh, Alex Kim. Uh, um, briefly, basically, a new proposal on an aggregation trace option for in, uh, for IOEM. Um, this is joint work with Laurent Metzger from OST. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the motivation of what this is about is um, the, the fact, basically, starting with IOM. IOM does allow to collect certain telemetry data across hops along a path. Um, However, basically any of the processing of the data needs to, of, co of course, occur offline. And there are also issues that, uh, that we need to contend with as we basically collect data from multiple hops and so forth, that the packet size may increase, uh, and also that the data needs to be correlated and so forth process, uh, processed further. Um, one, uh, uh, now, we do have a couple of use cases in which we would actually really like to aggregate, where we don't really need to have the individual data points but where we are actually more interested in the aggregate. For instance, um, uh, the average or point the minimum or maximum to find out basically where's the bottleneck or where's the extreme along a path, or also simply to sum things up. For instance, if we want to um, add up uh, certain latency information uh, across a path and uh, this sort of uh, item. And in order to accommodate that, we are proposing a new option in this draft, an aggregation trace option. Um, yeah, that would allow us to aggregate data during the traversal. Um, and aggregation means min, min max, sum, average, uh, increment, these types of operations, where basically the aggregate at each hop basically is formed by taking, performing a simple operation um, that aggregates a local piece of data with the aggregate that we had so far. Next one, please. So um, yeah, this this depicts basically the the, the, the proposed data structure that we have here. Um, essentially, the things to to to, to note is um, essentially we have an aggregator that is indicated uh, as basically the function that we want to use. The uh, 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 and then basically the metadata or the data uh, being the aggregate itself, as well as some auxiliary information such as the load ID and the hop. Count. Um, anyway, so we will leave this compliments I am nicely, and this seems to be the right landing spot. Thanks. Uh, Chunji? Hi, this is uh, Peter Chunji Liu here. I think it's definitely very interesting working here. Uh, I actually have uh, in a SEC dispatch, I have like a similar like a proof of transit work, but definitely the most criticism that I have is that it gives more cost to the packet. And I think this, you know, with uh, just, you know, an overall, you know, not hop by hop, you know, uh, record could be like, have many interesting use cases. Uh, I think um, this is, uh, for example, like choosing, determining like uh, what are the carbon emissions of our path or, uh, you know, minimax. Uh, I think that's very interesting, could be many use cases. Um, that's all, thanks. Yeah, this is Frank. Um... I would, would second that this is useful. Um, it's been proposed before and discussed before, and people, I think, right now are implementing this using um, this uh, opaque state snapshot or whatever we call this, uh, because it gives you the freedom to go and define whatever you, you want. But I think if, if there is more people that need this, then I think it would be worthwhile to go and do this as a standards effort. Thank you. All right, and then, thing up here, right? Yes, I think so. Okay, so the next one is a draft that was, uh, which is actually currently in Ops AWG, but we figure actually it makes more sense actually to put this into IPPM because this follows up on work that we had uh, here on the uh, position availability metrics that uh, Greg has. Um, uh, has been also presenting on where we currently have a draft in, from I, I, from IPPM in the ISG review. Um, and essentially this work here, or what this draft defines is basically it, it complements or extends uh, that work um, concerning 
Uh, well, I mean, the, the context again are pre uh, precision availability metrics. And as a reminder, I believe you have seen this diagram before. Um, the idea is that you have certain precision networking services which are defined by very tight uh, service level objectives. And you want to make sure, uh, well, and you want to basically maintain statistics or keep track of whether or not these, um, these, these, metro or th these SLOs are being violated or not. And if they are being violated, then effectively your high precision is not available, hence basic precision availability metrics. And uh, essentially what we want to do with this is we want to keep track, well, at the key there, the key there is keeping track of intervals during which violations of this metric, uh, of these metrics occur. Um, and uh, so, so basically we have this other uh, draft or this earlier work, which defines these metrics, but how to collect, uh, retrieve and export those metrics was not defined there. And uh, essentially this is basically where this draft comes in. It basically proposes a solution to extend IP fix to export these precision availability metrics. Um, and basically use it an IP fix. Why IP fix? Well, because it's widely used by operators to flow, to export flow statistics and why not basically having, well, this is kind of like a natural complement to that. Next slide, please. So, um, and therefore at the core of the document is really a set of new IP fix uh, elements, basically falling into two categories. The first category basically defines information elements for the different uh, precision availability metrics that have been defined basically in the, in the other draft. This includes for instance, things such as the violated intervals count, violation free, uh, violation free intervals count and so forth. And then in addition to those, we need to have a second category to reflect basically manifest information that provides the required context because obviously what is a violation or not depends very much on the SLO, uh, depending on how that is defined. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so therefore you do need to keep track of the context of that so that you know what the violation is or not. So, so that's basically a second complementary set of information elements are defined for that. And yeah, so currently nine information elements have been defined. Um, we did present this in IETF 117 in OPS AWG because we thought proximity to IP fix, which is in OPS, this would be suitable there. The feedback there was yes, but the domain expertise sits more with IPPM, mm -hmm. hence, the, hence the suggestion to bring this here. And obviously we would need to resubmit this with a new name. Uh, depending if this work is welcome here. So I think that is all that I have. Next slide. Okay, well, thank you. Well, this is Frank again. I have a very stupid question. So um, have you implemented that? And, and do you have ideas on how applicable that is? Because what we typically see is that we move out of precision if there's something going wrong. And if there's something going wrong, the last thing that you care about is IP fix. <laughs> well, you didn't, well, so to your question. No, I'm just wondering, like, do you have any experiences with, with actually building this? Uh, okay. This, Greg, do you want to respond to that? Yes, or? if I may. All right. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it's a good question. So again, uh, I think that um, um, the precision in this, um, terminology might be uh, somewhat confusing. The idea of uh, precision availability metric is that it is a combination of uh, um, metrics, uh, of potential metrics, number of um, performance uh, thresholds that being defined uh, for a service. So um, applicability is for their uh, multi-SLO environment. So when basically when SLA is composed of uh, several uh, requirements for uh, various performance metrics. So uh, that uh, idea is that um, operator may, uh, in combination with the uh, service uh, user, can define uh, several metrics and then they can be tracked as for the violation which uh, exposes or uh, detects uh, the trend of uh, deterioration and then uh, constitutes a uh, breaking uh, this uh, service basically when the service deemed uh, unavailable. 
so that reporting is uh, primarily targeted for uh, this critical area. So it's not that talkative, uh, basically reporting their benign information when uh, performance metrics are within bounds. So, okay. Thomas. Thomas Graf Swisscom. So I have some experience in IPFIX implementation and I can say that basically what you're proposing here is uh, uh, I don't see any problem to be implementable in the IP fix aggregation or export process. Thank you. Thank you. That's good feedback. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Ahmed? All right. Last one. Ooh. Then we have time. Yeah. Did it work? No. Do you want me to try? It disappeared. Yeah. Oh, it's just typing. Oh, uh, yeah, it was back here. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, for staying uh, until the last uh, five uh, minutes of, uh, of the session. So my name is Ahmed Absalam. I'm from Cisco Systems, and Very today, to the mic, okay. Yeah. And today I will um, I will be presenting uh, the uh, fast racing solution in uh, behalf of the co-authors uh, of this draft. It's, um, this is a revision five of the draft. The first revision was submitted at IETF uh, 113 and we presented there. So many thanks to all of the people who provide the, the review comments. Some of them already has been um, uh, addressed in this, uh, in this draft and the other one will be happy to, uh, to talk more and, uh, and address them. Next slide, please. So quickly, because it's a lightning talk, what is pass tracing? So what it does uh, provide you is a record of the packet pass as a sequence of interface ID. And in addition to that, you, uh, we provide a record of the end-to-end -end delay per hop and also the load on each egress interface along the packet delivery bus. A very key element of, uh, of pass tracing uh, in, uh, presented in this draft is basically the design uh, that was made for the hardware implementation in the base uh, forwarding pipeline. So in order to achieve that, we seek the minimum MTU overhead and every node along the path is going to record what is called midpoint uh, uh, compressed data with just three bytes of data that include um, the interface ID, a truncated timestamp and uh, indication of the load. Also, another element to be able to achieve that uh, hardware line rate implementation is the optimization of the header. So we minimize the variability in the header to make sure also all of the node along the packet path has to do the same editing. It doesn't depend on at which point in the path you are. It's the same um, data plane behavior. And it's important to mention that since this packet, uh, since this draft has been um, uh, proposed at IETF in um, uh, 113, we have five different ASIC now that implement this uh, solution and coming from uh, three different uh, vendors. And we have uh, uh, many uh, open source uh, stack and, and softwares. Next step, please. Then when it comes to, to the packet header, so if, as you can see, there is a, here is an example of pass tracing packet. So in pass tracing, we basically uh, differentiate between two different types of node. The first one is called the PT source node. Then the second is called PT midpoint and the third is called the PT sync. Here, what you see is a packet generated by the PT source node and it includes an IPv6 header then a hop by hop uh, uh, header, and then a destination option header. The IBV6 header will be used for transporting the packet from the source to the sink. Then we get the hop by hop header. It's a new IBV6 option defined for pass tracing to be carried in the IBV6 hop by hop header. The option type for that header is still to be defined. And the length of this header basically defines the size of the MCD stack. And the MCD stack is basically the place where each midpoint going to record its information. And just to remind, it's three bytes of information that every node has to record. Then the second header is the destination option header for pass tracing. So this is again a new IBV6 uh, option header. And thanks to 
some of the reviews that we got uh, when we presented the draft. Basically, in the past, this was an SRH uh, fast racing TLB, and we updated the, the draft, uh, we updated this header in, in the latest draft. And the header, uh, the option type for this uh, header is still to be defined, and it includes a 64 timestamp uh, field, plus the session ID and the interface ID and the interface load. This header is going to be bo used both by the source node when it, um, it generates a packet and also by the sync node before sending the packet to the collector for, uh, for processing. Next slide, please. Uh, for the next steps for this draft, we welcome the review from and the feedback from the IPPM working group, especially because we get some feedback uh, from the spring working group about if that work would be more convenient to be, uh, the, um, how to say, standardized here in the IPBM uh, working group. So we welcome the feedback from the group and the IPBM chair, and we will ask for an early adoption for um, uh, early allocation, sorry, for uh, the hop by hop and the destination option headers for this implementation. Thank you. Great, you want to queue? Um, thank you for bringing to IPPM because uh, I agree with you. Uh, this is uh, the community that uh, can provide uh, helpful uh, input. Um, a couple of things. So my understanding is that um, your current scope is for um, a service six. That's uh, an, an interesting uh, question because we just get an email also on the mailer that about how to say extending the scope of that solution to be any IPv6 network. So yeah, I think it's, uh, a, that's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting point and we, we definitely should. Yeah, that's, that's where I, I, I would like to point because uh, as uh, with the discussion of alternate marking method and IAM applicability, I, I believe that community decided that that should be generic for IPv6 rather than specific to SRV6 and use only SRH. Yeah, um, thanks for the feedback, and uh, we will mm -hmm. uh, definitely yeah. consider Thank you. this one. Thank you. Uh, really there is another question, yes. or okay. Would you write Deutsche Telekom? Uh, there are several proposals. I, I like this work and I like the proposal and it should be adopted by a suitable work group, I think. That's the first statement. The other one is um, there are several proposals how network nodes at a bottleneck should give feedback on utilization and uh, I don't know what. And some coded by three bits, other by four bits and some on layer two, others on layer three or layer four. I'd appreciate if the ITF community would come together and standardize all these features to the extent possible. I don't want to exclude anybody on any layer, but it might be nice if at least the codings are standardized. If, if uh, a load level is three bits here and four bits there, it's, it adds up at some point. And that would be great. And I think you also are aware that there are several proposals uh, having at least similar parameters. Thank you. Thanks, Rudiger. Well, Rudiger, one, one quick question. You mentioned uh, being adopted in an appropriate working group. <laughs> Do you have an opinion on which a working group is appropriate? I'm not the author, so it could it should be spring, I think. And I wonder why they didn't do that. Uh, that's my honest opinion. Okay. Thank you. As chairs, we want to get feedback on that. Uh, footer with Nokia. Sorry, am I next? Yeah, you're good. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, I, I think with the, the updates in the latest draft, this is not specific to SRV6 anymore. This is generic if you leave the SRH headers optional. So I think it's already generic to IPv6 or SRV6. There's nothing that makes it specific to SRV6 anymore. Is that correct? Uh, it's partially because there is an SRV6 endpoint uh, behavior uh, that, said, and, yeah, that yeah. forward the, the packet to the, to the controller. Okay, cool. Thomas Graf Swisscom, yeah, uh, just to following up on uh, Rüdiger's comments, also I think important is the data export um, to be considered. So uh, I would like to see some consistency with the other uh, IOM protocols. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. We ended just on time. Thank you everyone for a productive meeting. And we will see you on the mailing list. Um, thank you to the note takers. We captured all of the various actions we need to do. Appreciate that. See you next time.